So it's my honor and privilege for the sixth uh, Alpha Seminar of the year to receive a colleague from not that far, but uh, from the sister university, Karen, the, the big sister university, <laughs> Sylvia Wenmeka. She will discuss to, uh, with us measure in cosmology convention versus paradoxes. She will speak for maximum one hour. After that, we'll do a, five, a small five-minute breaks, and we will start the discussion with a comment of the Center from you see, right? You have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, hello. Uh, I have been working on infinitesimal probabilities, and for this seminar, um, I will try to look at this work through the lens of conventions and measure theory and probability theory. And I will discuss two case studies that are related to cosmology, where um, infinite spaces of possibilities um, yeah, pop up more or less naturally. So that is the combination of words in the title. Um, <clears throat> but I want to uh, start by motivating why I'm interested in looking at paradoxes. Uh, so if you look in the history of mathematics and even now, um, many mathematicians want to avoid paradoxes for, I think, obvious reasons. But there are a few exceptions of, of, of people who are really interested in them. And one of them is uh, Torricelli. He was working on a theory of indivisibles uh, developed by Cavalieri. And they were ver that theory was very well known for generating paradoxes. And uh, the way uh, Torricelli approaches was not to try to avoid them, but he actually developed new versions of these paradoxes to study what is going on here. So I found a description about his work that uh, says that he was doing mathematical experiments <coughs> and uh, that it is a bit like uh, in the lab where you put a system under extreme stress. So likewise, uh, he was uh, pushing logic to the extremes and thereby he tried to learn something about the system and the study, in this case the continuum. So that is my approach to paradoxes. But obviously, even in the context where I'm talking about them, um, uh, many people don't like them, and a very vocal person who wrote about this was a physicist and a probabilist, E.T. James. Uh, so he has some very nice uh, quotes about his dislike for what, what I am doing. Uh, he calls it a Pandora's box of useless uh, um, and unnecessary paradoxes. Um, I also like the way he, he turned it into a verb because he talks about infinite set paradoxing. So he calls that a morbid infection in probability theory. And to make it worse, in the last quote he says, it's actually in all of mathematics. And then he says that it's the careless use of infinite sets, but also uh, infinite quantities and infinitesimals uh, that generates, generates most paradoxes. Actually here, I am in complete agreement. Indeed, the keyword is careless. <laughs> Let's not do that. Let's do it carefully, right? Okay. So in terms of uh, the context in which these paradoxes popped up and sort of yeah, drew me in, um, that maybe these paradoxes and probability theory are indeed affecting other fields. So I have two case studies from cosmology. Um, and the first part of my talk will be about the context of eternal inflation. And there is a relatively straightforward paradox from probability theory that pops up. Um, and the second half of the talk should be about um, a more recent, uh, more speculative model. Uh, it's actually about the problem of time in cosmology. And the paradox is more subtle and maybe also more interesting. And in terms of the payoff of analyzing probability in this context for cosmology, I will already warn you, it's limited in the first half, but I still present it that way because it allows me to introduce a lot of things that will also, should also help us in, in the second part, and I do think there is more payoff there, also for thinking about the problem in cosmology. So, regarding the first context, um, eternal inflation, um, I'm, I definitely don't consider myself a specialist in this. I had one course uh, long ago on Big Bang um, uh, physics, uh, so it, actually the problem was already there, so I, I will introduce it to you, but I will focus obviously on the part where the measure comes in and where probability starts to play a role. But just as background knowledge, why are cosmologists even considering inflation and what is it actually? 
So they absor observe a lot of things in the contemporary universe. For instance, the fact that it is already very big, it's still expanding, and in many senses, it's very homogeneous. And th so the, the list of observations here can all be um, explained if we postulate, if we assume that in the very young universe, there has been a period of very rapid and, in fact, accelerated expan expansion. <coughs> And that is what this word inflation refers to. Um, so there's also, there are also toy models that try to model how that could happen physically. And typically when physicists have to explain something like that, they postulate a field. So in this case, there is um, an inflaton, a type of field, where it's assumed that at the start of the universe, or in the very young universe, uh, this, uh, this uh, is not in the most stable uh, situation. It is a, a, um, um, an equilibrium, but it's an unstable one. So the idea is that naturally this field will go to its, um, its real um, stable equilibrium. So th those are some terms that uh, pop up in this discussion. And it was discovered uh, already in the 80s, so very early on, that if you assume that such a field exists and you have a number of seemingly plausible assumptions about the models that the region where this field has already stabilized such that the inflation stops, <coughs> uh, that rate of, of decay is actually um, slower than uh, the expansion of the regions where it is still expanding at an accelerated rate. So the picture you get is of a very large structure, something larger than what we usually think of as the universe, where local regions have already stabilized, so inflation ends there, but it's sort of, these regions are patches or bubbles or pockets in a larger structure that is itself still accelerated in its expansion. So that is the problem of an inter eternal inflation. So the idea is that we, what we usually consider as the universe, as everything there is, is only one of those pockets, and what we see in our history, or what we interpret as our Big Bang, was in that sense only a local phenomenon. Local for this pocket, but this larger structure is still accelerated and, uh, in, in its expansion. Now, in this structure, there pops up a measure uh, problem. Once you start qu asking questions about the probability that our universe would have certain pro pro properties, basically. Um, so the question is, what is a good measure, and in the end, what is a good probability measure over these pocket universes? But in, the, in this type of model, there will be infinitely many. And then we find uh, Alan Good in a, um, a review already from 2000, so also not recent, uh, who states the, say, says th things like, anything that can happen in such a structure will happen, anything is possible, uh, and what he means is that any physical possibility will be realized in one universe or another. There are infinitely many of them. And also that a fraction of universes with a particular property is a ratio of infinity to infinity and that's meaningless. So that is the measure problem in this context. And then he even introduces a model system that is very well studied um, in the context of probability theory and that is connected to a well-known paradox there. And he says, let's talk about the integers. But from the context, it's clear that he's talking about the positive integers. Uh, and he tries to compare the problem there of assigning probability, uh, of probabilities to drawing random integers from the natural numbers uh, to the problem of assigning a measure to these properties of pocket universes. And he suggests that there is no right way to assign probabilities in, in this model system, and therefore, there is not really an answer to the measure problem in cosmology. Now, <clears throat> my, when, when I looked at this, I had the uh, impression that um, the way he presents the problem is not exactly adequate, or at least that is not the received view for probabilist of what is going on here. So that is why I want to talk about the fair infinite lottery for a bit, just as a model system without a connection to cosmology, and we can connect it back at the end. So what is, usually, um, what is the usual presentation of the problem? Um, it's um, sort of a thought experiment. Imagine there is such a thing as a fair lottery on the set of natural numbers. Uh, by fair, we mean that any possible natural number has an equal probability to any other one. Um, 
And now uh, we, we can wonder what would that equal probability be? And one option is that we would assign zero probability to inf um, individual tickets. But that would mean that the sum of the probabilities of all the tickets is zero. And in, in, in probability theory, there is uh, an assumption that is called countable additivity that says that such a sum, the sum of all the individual probabilities of all possible outcomes, should equal the probability of the whole sample space, and that is one. But zero can never be one, so that is not an option. So the other option is that there is some non-zero probability that we assign to the individual tickets, but again, if you compute the sum, it will be infinite, and you cannot normalize that. So that is the problem there. Um, so there's a, an inconsistency between the assumption of a fair lottery and the natural numbers, countable additivity, and normality. So the assumption that the probability measure um, is one for the whole sample space. Um, to see where that analysis comes from, we have to look at conventional probability theory and what the assumptions are, what the actions are. So conventional probability theory goes back to the 1930s by Komogor. Um, there are uh, f uh, four actions and, and, and sort of a preamble, so there are also already conventional choices uh, at the very start. For instance, it's assumed that probability values are real values, real numbers. Um, it is assumed that they are always uh, <coughs> zero or, or, or positive, so non negative, that the whole sample space, which I indicate here by omega, which in this example is the set of natural numbers, is one. And then there are two assumptions about uh, additivity. One is that if you have two possible outcomes um, that don't uh, overlap, that are mutually exclusive, that the probability of their union is equal to the sum of the individual probabilities. Um, that is enough for the finite case, those actions. And then for the infinite case, there is another conventional choice in the actions. Komogar said, for mathematical convenience, let's assume that this property generalizes to the countably infinite case. It cannot be made to, uh, to work in the general infinite case, but in the countable, in a, in a, when, when there are countably many uh, non-overlapping events, we assume that you have a similar uh, rule there, an analogous rule. Um, and there is a sort of coherence between the, uh, between the assumptions because we are using the real numbers here. And the type of limit you need to talk about countable infinity is actually exactly the type of limit operation that you use to construct the real numbers out of the, uh, the rational expense. So there is a certain coherence in these assumptions. But, as we have seen, there are cases where these assumptions lead to paradoxical situation, namely if we have uh, a fair lottery on natural numbers, so we have uniformity over the singletons, and the, inf the sample space is also kind of the infinite. So you would assume maybe that <coughs> um, because there is this countable notion here as well that this works very well together, but it's actually the only case where it breaks down. And I would say this, so there is like a, a mutual inconsistency between the type of model system and the yeah, com conventional choices and the probability theory that we are using. That is not actually how Good uh, wrote about it. Uh, and some other authors uh, do the same thing. They say that a fair lottery on natural numbers is an intrinsically paradoxical or intrinsically um, inconsistent notion that you cannot even think about it in the right way, that you will always be implicitly making errors. I have the impression, maybe I'm wrong, but I have the impression that they take the standard probability theory sort of as unquestionable. And from that viewpoint, of course, you, you, you draw the conclusion that the problem is the model system. I would say there are reasons to think that it's more subtle because there are alternative theories and all of them, uh, there are actually even more than, that, than, than the ones on the slide, but those are I think the most interesting one or the most well-developed ones, all of them do allow us to say something about the model system. So I think it's more subtle. So let's start with the most obvious thing you, or the most obvious theory you could consider if you take this as a serious problem that you cannot describe such a lottery, um, that is to simply drop the, uh, the final uh, action about additivity in the infinite case and say it has to be finitely additive, that's all we need. 
Um, in that case, you can even be a bit more strict about which events you can describe, or you, you can describe more of that, so there will be fewer or actually no unmeasurable sets. So, so more sigma algebra here. Yeah, this, it, it's the sigma algebra of the whole uh, R set. Yeah, so there is a unique choice. Yeah, no additional choices, which is nice. Uh, so in this case, it suffices to assign, do, you can assign probability zero to individual events. Another way to, to arrive at, the, at this type of theory is if you go by something that's used in number theory, it's called natural density. <coughs> there you look at um, uh, initial segments of uh, subsets of the natural numbers and you extend sort of your view, your, your view of win window and um, you, you count how many of the uh, um, elements in the, uh, how many of the natural numbers are in the event of interest. You normalize by how big your window is and you take the limit to infinity. If you do that for singleton events, that density will be zero. Um, it will be a half, for instance, for the even numbers. It will be one for the, for the natural numbers as well. So this uh, is actually consistent with the actions here, but it's sort of a different way to arrive at that conclusion. Now, uh, finitely additive probability was uh, famously defended by uh, uh, the Finetti, for instance, specifically for the reason of the problem with the natural numbers and the fair, fair distribution. Others have arrived at, at this theory for other reasons, but I think in this context, the Finetti is more interesting. Of course, let's look at let's look at the response of James. Uh, he was not impressed. He said, um, "Do we really believe that an infinite numbers of zeros can add up to one? Obviously, there is no action in finite, uh, finitely additive probability that says that this is the case." But but James had the impression that yeah, you're sort of pretending that it doesn't. But yeah, so you are answering yes without seeming to do so. So I think he's, he was still um, using this intuition from the conventional theory to, to, to look at this new proposal. So I'm not entirely convinced by his hesitation here. And the Finelli had another response. He said that, OK, OK, indeed, uh, adding infinitely many zeros, <coughs> saying that that is equal to 1, that is absurd, I agree. But it would be true if you substitute actual infinitesimals instead of zero. And that is something that leads me to another proposal, the one I've worked on the most myself. That is, what if we take that seriously? Can't we assign an infinitesimal number to the individual outcomes as their probability? So to do that, we cannot um, stick to the, to the conventional choice of the real numbers as the value set for probabilities. We need a value set that does include infinitesimals. Uh, so that brings me to a proposal I've worked on that's called non archimedean probability. We try to stay as close as possible to the conventional theory of Kolmogorov, but we had to make a number of changes. So the first one is already in the preamble. So here we allow a set of values that includes the real numbers, but it can be bigger. And we don't actually fix in advance which it is exactly but it will always be a non-standard model of the real number such that it includes uh, infinitesimals. Um, for the first action, we, are, we can actually require more than Kolmogorov did. Uh, so that is one of the additional motivations for this theory. That is that um, we don't allow probability zero for a possible event. So if this is a non-empty set, we require the probability to be strictly positive. That is not the case in standard probability theory. We stick to the normality action, uh, we stick to finite additivity, and the most technical action and the most, um, yeah, uh, the biggest change in this theory is actually how does additivity work in the infinite case. I will not uh, explain the details, I just wanted to show you that this looks more complicated, and that is actually di a direct consequence of the difference between doing things conventionally and doing it, do, doing it in a different way. Because what we could use in the, in the, in the Kolmogorov case was the standard limit operation. So I didn't have to include in the action the definition of the limit operation. But here I, we sort of had to uh, include the, an alternative limit, what we call a non archimedean limit operation. We have to introduce it on the fly to explain how the action works. 
So what we are doing here is to assign to uh, these natural densities, for instance, a limit, but a limit that takes a value in a set that includes infinitesimals. Um, that cannot be the standard limit operation because that will, by definition, only give us real value to our answers. And this limit works such that if we sum up all these um, infinitesimals that are assigned to individual tickets, they do sum back exactly to 1. And not 1 minus an infinitesimal with some other number. So there is, again, coherence between different assumptions. Uh, um, yeah, small sure. For clarification. Sure. Uh, this R, uh, this curly R thing, mm -hmm. uh, you said that it has to be a, a model, non-standard model uh, for the actions? For the, for the real numbers. So it's a yeah. non-standard model of... Uh, it's not any R, it's, 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 uh, no, because it's, it's the, a, the yeah. hyperreals, I guess. Yeah, it's the hyperreals. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, thanks. Okay. Yeah, so um, it depends on um, what the <coughs> sample space is how big this non-standard model has to be. So we cannot fix it in advance, but it will always be the way this action works. If you look at the consistency proof, it, it contains a recipe of constructing the specific R if you know what omega is. So that is how it, it comes in, yeah. Um, okay, so in this case, we can assign a particular infinitesimal to singleton events, and I've called it one divided by alpha and actually, yeah, I cannot introduce <coughs> everything related to this idea, but there is a theory uh, developed by uh, Lee Benchy to assign sizes to infinite sets that also uses, uh, for instance, the hypernatural numbers. So it is more fine-grained than cardinality and again sensitive to even um, removing one element from a set. So you can think of the type of probability um, that we are uh, defining by these type of actions as sort of a normalized numerosity uh, function. So the numerosity of the natural numbers would be alpha, and one divided by alpha is the probability of a single ticket. So in terms of the idea of a natural density, we actually follow that idea, only the limit operation that we impose on it is different. So instead of zero, uh, it will be a number that is infinitely close to zero, but crucially different. And as I said, it will be, in our notation, 1 divided by alpha. Now, for the, for, for the whole sample space, it, it, is, it is 1, of course, uh, by uh, the normality action. But um, the infinite sets that are not co-finite, they start to show weird behavior. For instance, for the even numbers, you would expect probability half. But it is a bit more subtle than that, actually. Uh, it depends on the question of whether alpha is even or not. So you have to make a lot of assumptions. If it's even, it's a half. Uh, if it's not, it's a, the probability is actually slightly smaller. Because the, the way we, we define the natural numbers, we start at 1. So 1 is, makes that head start. And uh, that is why the evens could end up losing sort of half an infinitesimal, and even in the, in the non-standard limit. And it gets worse for some other um, infinite sets. So the, uh, this, this is now an infinitesimal difference between the possible assignments, but what are non-measurable sets on the standard theory, those are actually uh, sets that on our um, proposal have a, a whole, um, a finite range of possible values. So I also think of it as sort of measuring how pathological these sets are, and even this one is like infinitesimally pathological. Okay, so that is, uh, non-conventional -convention approach. And there is another sort of easy solution that you could consider, easier than the one I just showed. So there is another action I didn't say much about yet, that is the normality assumption. I think in terms of convention, um, there are actually two components in this, in this uh, action. One is really a convention. Why is it one and not 10 or 100? That's arbitrary. The real restriction that the action imposes is that the measure is not allowed to be uniformly zero, because then it wouldn't be normalizable. Uh, and it's also not unbounded. But what if we drop that? that? That would also help us in the infinite case. And then maybe we use the extended real number so we can assign probability, quasi-probability plus infinity. But it is strange uh, if you're used to working with uh, normalized probabilities 
but it is not impossible. Um, you could, for instance, assign probability 1 to the signal. That's, again, arbitrary in a way. You could also say 10 or half or whatever. But some non-zero number, let's call it 1. And, of course, the measure of the whole um, natural numbers will be infinite. And also that of the even numbers will be infinite. So you lose a lot of resolution in that sense. But for all the finite sets, you keep the usual, I, I call it resolution. So again, you can think of the natural density approach. And now what you divide is just a normalization factor, which is exactly what you would expect, I guess. But it diverges, and that is now allowed. Um, but it is weird, right? So you cannot distinguish these infinite sets in terms of their measure. But you could also consider what happens if you look at conditional probabilities. So I realize I haven't properly introduced them. Uh, but if you, if you do that, uh, what you will find is actually if you normalize it on the whole sample space, you get back the probabilities you got in finitely additive <coughs> probability theory. So that's sort of interesting to see that the conditional approach here helps you with the loss of sort of um, yeah, fine greatness in the infinite case because now you can distinguish uh, this. Um, but it comes at the price of again ending up in losing capital additivity. Okay, so as I said, the payoff for cosmology, I think, is limited for this case. Um, I don't think we really have a way of getting past the measure problem in cosmology by using a different probability theory. But I do think it clarifies where the problem is exactly. So I don't think Good is right in suggesting that there is no way to assign probabilities to that model system of the integers. There are different approaches if you are willing to give up some conventions. And I think it's also very interesting if you're a pluralist about these theories, you can sort of do it side by side. And as a whole picture, I think it gives a lot of insight about what is going on in the model system. But what if you now want to apply it to pocket universes in inflationary cosmology? Well, then you end up at the, at the question, what would the natural order be to consider these pockets to, to use this idea in one way or another of a natural density? whether it's in a conventional theory or, or an unconventional one, there was always the, this idea of you look at initial segments and then you go to the limit. But then the question is about the order of how to do that. And the natural numbers have, an, have, have a canonical order, and you use that, and, and that gives you the answers. But in cosmology, the way these models work, um, the, these things are sort of outside of each other's uh, light cones, so there isn't really a way to find a natural order. And I think that is the real problem. So if that is the analogy, then it's fine. But the problem doesn't really come from probability theory itself. That's my impression. And moreover, it's actually not clear that the countable infinite lottery is the right model system to begin with. I find very few authors who remark this. So many cosmologists assume there is a countable infinity of, of pocket universes. But they also say it forms a fractal structure. And I think many fractal structures naturally lead to actually a non-denumerable universe or like meta universe, I don't know how to call it, whole of pocket universes. So maybe they are even focusing on sort of the wrong side of the problem. Because if it's an uncountable collection, the, the problem I have been discussing the whole time doesn't even really arise. It's not the main issue. It's the order that is lagging that's that's the problem. Okay. So if you were losing track, this is actually a good time to <laughs> try again. Um, because I will introduce a different problem. I hope that you can sort of use our investment in the first half to understand what kind of alternatives you have to deal with it. Uh, but the problem that is addressed is really a different starting point. So this is a question about the arrow of time in cosmology. And there is actually a lot that statistical mechanics helps us to understand about the era of time, at least the one that is driven by entropy. Uh, it helps us to understand why entropy seems to increase spontaneously towards the future. Uh, the answer, or a large part of the answer, was given by Boltzmann. And it has to do with the idea that there are many way, more ways to have high entropy and therefore to appear disorder in certain uh, systems that we are uh, very much used to, but it, it may not apply in other systems. Um, there are more microstates that co correspond to a high entropy state and to a low entropy state. And therefore, if there is a certain dynamics, 
that in principle gives you equal access or um, makes it equally prob probable to go to any other state uh, that you will end up in one of those high entropy states simply because there are more of them. So the usual picture that is drawn is that there is a fixed space, so there, these are the possible physical states. There is some dynamics on them. And there is a very tiny region that is actually always drawn too big, but that corresponds to low entropy uh, states that, that we can see around us. And, it, and there are many more paths that lead to higher uh, entropy, and only very few that would keep you inside of that uh, region. So that is part of the question of where the arrow of time comes from. <coughs> But it doesn't really answer the, the question in the context of cosmology because it only tells you what happens if you start from low entropy condition. So we seem to see in our past a low entropy young universe, and only this mechanism doesn't really explain that. If anything, starting from what we know today, we would also expect in the backward direction that we are coming from a high entropy state because there are so many of them. So there is something missing. And what is usually done, either implicitly or explicitly, is just to put this in. Uh, this low entropy uh, initial condition is sort of uh, taken as given, and from there we understand why the entropy would, would uh, indeed increase. So that has been called the past hypothesis. So we postulate it in. But the question is, do we really have to do that, or is there another way to do it? And there have been proposals in the last years that are called central time models. And the physics, so, so the dynamics of how states evolve to each other, are exactly the same as in standard statistical mechanics. Um, there is only one other uh, assumption that's always in place in, in statistical mechanics that is given up. And that is the idea that everything happens inside of a bounded volume. And in statistical mechanics, that is sort of very understandable that the assumption was there to begin with, because it was about gases and boxes and how you connect them and in engines. There is always a well-defined laboratory setting with a finite volume. But in cosmology, it's actually not clear what the box would even be. Why, why would there be an upper volume? So some authors started from this uh, point and said, what if you have uh, a classical gas in the box, but no box, basically. Um, so what happens then is that the collection of, of particles can keep expanding. So that means that the entropy can keep, keep increasing without bounds. Um, and these others, the way they write about that is that any actual realization of the entropy can be considered to be a low entropy. Because there are only f there's only a finite interval how it could be lower, but there is this open-ended interval of how it could be Bigger. So that already sounds a bit like what you have with, with the drawing of a natural uh, numbers lottery. Because if I have done the drawing, I expect a gigantically large number. But once I tell you what it is, you can always tell me, whoa, it's so low. I mean, there are only finitely many ways how it could be even lower, but infinitely many ways how it could be bigger. But that is the case for no matter what the outcome is. So there isn't like a similar uh, sort of spirit in this proposal. So in this case, you have an arrow of time that will go up in one direction, and if you extrapolate the state back, it will go down to a certain point, but that is not postulated in my hand, and from that point on, it goes up again. So that, that point would look like a big bang. It would look as if from that um, point, the entropy increases, but actually in two branches of the universe. So that is the proposal, and if you if you think of it in terms of Boltzmann, it's the drawing I had in the beginning. So you expect spontaneously higher entropy regions will be visited, but that goes up all the way until, yeah, without bound. Now a paradox that is related to this um, to this issue. So in this context, good again the same author uh, who also proposed inflation and then discovered the eternal inflation problem. He said that. Um, in this case, if we have this kind of model, the probability should be normalizable. So it just says that. It's, it should be conventional probabilities, basically. And therefore, we cannot have a uniform probability distribution on yeah, the volume, on, on the position of these particles, anything like that. That is not logically possible, he says. But I think that only happens, again, because he assumes uh, probability theory as the only context in which you can. And he even introduced a paradox, he didn't really name it, 
uh, but I recognize it as um, a paradox that is usually not called the two envelopes paradox, but it is the way I will tell it to you. So, imagine two envelopes. And uh, imagine, although we have been here the first uh, half as well, imagine there is such a thing as a fair lottery on natural numbers. Maybe not smart to assume that, but let's assume that it exists. And assume that actually uh, two drawings have taken place and the results have been put in these two envelopes. And now the first envelope will be opened. I tell you the number that I have in it. And now we are thinking about what is the probability that the number in the closed envelope is bigger than this one? Or what is the probability that the one you saw is the biggest one? Let's do that. So now you can make this reasoning that I already indicated. There are only finitely many ways how the number in the other uh, envelope can be smaller. There are infinitely many ways how it could be bigger. And all these individual ways are equally probable because we have a fair lottery. So it seems then that the probability, um, given that you know what, what is in the first envelope, that, the, uh, that this is the biggest one should be zero. Let's assume we, are, we have some way of doing this with standard probabilities. And, but that is the case no matter what the number is. I didn't tell you the number, and we could already do this. So it seems that this con condition here doesn't play a role. So it seems that the probability that it is bigger, too cool, I can say that here, is, is zero. I don't know how to say that. Okay. okay. But of course, there is a problem because. I could have told the same story by opening the other envelope first, and then we would have concluded that the same probability is one that can open be true. And maybe you even have the intuition that by symmetry, for instance, this probability should be half. I don't know if you have that intuition, it's not really needed to set up the paradox, but in any case, there is something really wrong here. And of course, you know what is wrong. Uh, we know that the assumption of a fair lottery on the natural numbers is inconsistent with uh, standard probability theory, and I have been sort of pretending to use it, but it cannot really work. Now, the way uh, this, this um, probability paradox was discussed was actually very clearly analyzed, by the, again, by the Finetti. Um, and uh, he connected it to a property that uh, is actually a theorem in standard probability theory, but that none of the, of the alternatives that I discussed, that's the theorem, um, that, that would indeed allow us to, to make this step from this is true for any conditional event to this is true for the uh, unconditional event. There is a theorem in standard probability theory that if you could get it started to begin with, that would indeed allow you to make this move. But that is not a theorem in any of the alternatives. So that is what is, what is going on. Um, so to, to explain this more clearly, I do have to tell you how conditional probability is defined because you saw it play a crucial role, right? Um, so there are more complicated cases where this def definition doesn't suffice, but if the probability of the conditioning event is non-zero, and that is the case for us, um, or, yeah, let's see, for the definition, let's assume that this is the case, then the probability of an event A given B is equal to the probability of their uh, intersection, and then sort of renormalized or divided by the probability of the conditioning event. Now I can tell you what uh, conglomerability is. Um, and maybe I can do it by an example. Let's say um, I'm interested in the uh, probability that um, it will be, um, what can I say? It will be more than 10 degrees tomorrow, let's say something like that. And let's say that is that event. And what I know is the probability that it will be more than 10 degrees given that it's sunny, that's this event. And I know the probability that um, it will be more than 10 degrees when, when it's uh, cloudy. And let's assume that those two conditional probabilities were, let's say, um, 0.3 and 0.4. Now my question to you is, could it happen that the probability that it will be more than uh, 10 degrees is 0.6, for instance? So the, the other ones were 0.3, 0.4. Could it now be that the unconditional probability is, for instance, 0.6? Could that happen? No, <laughs> it could not happen. 
So we would expect that the probability of your unconditional event lies somewhere in the range of 0.3 and 0.4. Right? It has to be between them. Um, and there is a theorem on standard probability theory that's, uh, for instance, the law of total probability that tells you that it's sort of a weighted average of those two. And there is another theorem that, that tells you more directly that it has to lie in the interval. And that is, in this case, finite conglomerability. So that basically means unconditional probabilities are sane in the sense that they lie in the interval of the conditional probabilities where the conditioning events form a, a partition of the sample space. Fine. And you could also imagine that in the standard probability theory, uh, it's natural to ask, but what if you have a countably infinite sample space? Does it still work? And the answer is yes. Because in the proof, what you what do you need? Normality and countable activity. So that is indeed a theorem. Um, but not general conglomerability. So if you have a non-denumerable partition, you have insane unconditional probability in that sense. They can lie outside of the range of, of the conditional probability. So there is a sense of non-conglomerability in any probability. Now that I have explained this, I can tell you what we were actually doing when we were doing this thought experiment with the two envelopes. There were two outcomes um, in terms of natural numbers. So they span up my sample space. I have the first outcome on this axis and the other one here. And when I was asking you to imagine you open up the first envelope and you then know what the probability is, what you are doing is actually carving up the sample space into a partition in strips like this. So this is an event where the first uh, probability is 1, 2, 3, or any number. So we are using strips like that. And that is indeed a partition of the sample space. And if I then ask you what is the probability that the uh, first uh, number is the bigger one, what you are looking at, at is an, inside the strip. Uh, the probability that the first one is bigger is this finite part, that the second one is bigger is this open-ended unbound number. So that is why we ended up with the intuition that the probability of the first being um, bigger is zero. And the other way around, you make strips like that. So that is the partition that are playing a role here. But the problem is there is no, there is no way to get it started um, with uh, standard probability theory, so you can never apply the theorem that uh, infinity proof. So what happens in these alternative theories that you all have heard of recently? Uh, if you have finitely additive probabilities, um, then the, you agree actually with the step that, for instance, the conditional probabilities are zero, all of them. But it, that is not inconsistent with the saying, for instance, that the unconditional probability is a half, because there's no theorem that allows, um, that um, forces you to, to stay in the range of the zeros. Uh, likewise, for the non-normalizable non option, uh, all these uh, strips are like finite in length, uh, so there is some finite number in each case, but um, the event in the unconditional case is an infinite one. So again, you go out of the range, and also with the um, uh, non-accommodient solution, um, you end up at half, in this case also times one minus an infinitesimal for a different reason. Here it's actually well determined. That is because we have to exclude the case where there are exactly so that has not, nothing to do with pathologically, uh, pathological sets here. But again, it's not in the range of the infinitesimal probability of the condition. So we end up with uh, non-conglomerability already in the countable case. But yeah, now maybe I, I will not go into details. Maybe I'll, I will t tell you this part more or less qualitatively. What I find interesting, and that is why maybe here is something to be added also for, for cosmology, is that you can say a bit more in the non-Archimedean case. Uh, so what I discovered here is actually that there are sets, or there are partitions on which you get conglomerability, not this one, but um, you only get conglomerability if the sets in the partition are finite. So there can be infinitely many, in that sense it's an infinite partition, but they have to be finite, and there's actually an additional condition they sort of have to be in agreement with, or they have to be related to, the way this non-standard limit is defined. So it's not the case that you have arbitrary um, uh, conglomerability, but you can get conglomerability 
on partitions of arbitrary cardinality as long as the sets in them are finite and, in a particular well-defined way, related to how the, the limit operation works. So there, there is something there that saves a sense of conglomerability in the infinite case that is not there in any of the other alternatives, and maybe that can be used in, uh, in, in applications. So I'm skipping the part where I yeah, did this with, I don't know why, with format. Uh, but it corresponds to, to what I said, uh, quality. So now uh, the question is, what, what about the cosmologists? Are they aware of this? And, and interesting is, it seems that they are, in a sense, or at least some of them. Um, I found in particular one paper that says very similar things, even though they don't use this vocabulary. So they don't seem to be, they don't know the, the finetti and the history and probability, but they have rediscovered this, and I think they, they make very sane conclusions. Uh, and they agree, actually, with the way I look at it. So there is a toy model uh, in a paper of 2016 for a central time model, so exactly the case that I started from to motivate uh, looking at this paradox, where the sample space uh, looks like this. There is um, uh, an axis that, that you can think of as a, as a sort of a time axis, and there is something like um, entropy axis, or something um, um, yeah, related to entropy, uh, proportional to entropy. And the sample space is actually within this parabola. And you can already relate it to, um, uh, to central time models. So the idea is that a universe in this model, uh, how does the entropy evolve in time? Well, it will be one of those parabolic trajectories. And it could be any of them, but it's one of those. Uh, and what they found here was that if you ask questions about what is the probability that uh, such a universe is close to its central time. Uh, it depends on how you model it exactly, in the sense that uh, what, um, what uh, you, you, you take um, to be picking out a universe. Is it something um, at a certain level of entropy, or is it something uh, that stays on, on the same trajectory? And depending on that, you get different conditional probabilities with non-overlapping ranges. So that already shows you that, in this case, you cannot really have that the unconditional probability always lies in the range because they are non-overlapping. So they rediscovered this. Uh, it's a more uh, interesting case because it's directly related to sort of a physical uh, model system. And it's also with non-uniform probabilities. So that's also a difference from the, from the um, the, the two lottery, um, the two envelopes uh, paradox. Um, but the way these partitions work, I try to indicate it with the colors. They are not <coughs> these vertical and horizontal strips, but they are strips like this. That's one partition. And the other one uh, is uh, these parabolic segments, uh, these stripes. They give these uh, in inconsistent or at least incompatible conditional probabilities. And what I wanted to mention about it is actually that you immediately see that this one is, has an infinite area. And I told you that in the case with non archimedean probabilities, uh, you can have an infinite partition, but the members of the partition have, have to be finite. So in, in the theory uh, uh, with infinitesimals, the, the partition into these kind of strips will never give you conglomerability, but it turns out that this one does. So it seems that here there's actually an additional argument to take the predictions or the values that come out of using that partition as more physically relevant than the other choice. And in this case, I think there is more going on than convention. I think there is actually a mathematical reason behind it. So to end where we started, I will give James the last word. What did he say about non-conglomerability? Well, for him, uh, it was a paradox out of control. So we have in institutionalized this now. Um, uh, it's now told as the truth. So many unwary minds have been trapped. Um, it has gone public. So uh, he thought that we really shouldn't allow non-conglomerability. Uh, but of course, there was never conglomerability in the first place, because in the uncountable case, there is no other option than to accept it. So I myself think that maybe it's not as bad as we thought. 
Um, and my final slide is actually an overview with the different um, theories that we saw, the conventional one, finitely additive one, the non-normalized one, and the non-archimedean one, and what kind of assumptions you can, um, yeah, what you can um, um, combine consistently. So there is no package where you can uh, do everything you, you would maybe at the start intuitively expect you could do. For instance, perfect additivity doesn't really exist in most theories. Uh, perfect conglomerability doesn't really exist. Um, and um, in, in any case, there are different combinations of uh, assumptions and type of model systems that you can uh, model. There is one additional option that is not a quantitative theory, that is Norton's um, infinite lottery logic. So, yeah, in the paper uh, behind this presentation, I also discussed that one. So, a lot of these uh, issues don't really apply to that theory because it doesn't try to assign numerical values to, uh, to, to events. It only orders them. But it does have a lot of nice properties, so I did want to at least mention there is another option. Um, but that is sort of the overview of things we've seen. In so thank you, and uh, let's discuss afterwards. <laughs>
this. Um, <laughs> so, to start the discussion, let's give the floor to Peter Thiessen from Musée Louvain, and after that, free discussion. Everybody online or, or in the group, among the three person, two person, zero. See if we have it here. Please be. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So yeah, I wrote down a couple of things. Well, first of all, I really enjoyed the three. I think it was really clear and then something very different. Secondly, I, I'm no expert in the foundation of probability, <coughs> the science of philosophy of internal inflation cosmology. So I'm not going to be offering much of a comment. Instead, I'm just going to raise a couple of questions that uh, came up when I was listening to your talk, uh, mostly for clarification. Maybe just a brief comment about paradoxes, because I really loved the cartoon that you showed where you have the, the little guy with infinity sparkles in his eyes. <laughs> I've seen that sparkle in your eyes. <laughs> I'm sure people have seen the sparkle in my eyes when I'm talking about time travel paradoxes. Yeah. So I fully agree that paradoxes, they be captivate, they fascinate, they can provoke and seduce us. And most importantly, they arouse our curiosity, they can stimulate us and motivate us in our research. But so when, I, when, I, when I'm teaching about time travel paradoxes, I, I usually make a distinction between two kinds of paradoxes, which I call weak and strong paradoxes. Um, and so weak paradoxes typically go away on the closer inspection, whereas the strong paradoxes typically pose much deeper problems. So they indicate that there's just something deeply flawed in our understanding by posing some kind of form of inconsistency or a logical contradiction. Uh, so they're very different. So for example, for time travel paradoxes, I think most information paradoxes are weak. They're, they're very puzzling and surprising and counterintuitive, but they're not logically inconsistent in the way that the strong paradox would be, such as the grandfather paradoxes, uh, most famously. And so I was wondering how, what the situation is in probability theory, and it seems to be that, that in probability theory, maybe most paradoxes are, are weak. It seems that it's particularly rich in weak paradoxes because, because we're just pretty bad probabilistic thinkers, and so they're very prone to probabilistic fallacy. So I was thinking about Simpson's paradox, uh, the multi hole problem, and then there are many, many others. Um, but I think that the strong paradoxes are much more interesting. And so there I think about sleeping beauty, um, Newcomb's problem, and clearly now the, the two paradoxes that you mentioned, so the infinite fair lottery paradox and the two Andrew paradox. And so, so when you're trying to resolve these paradoxes, I think with weak paradoxes, it will lead to, to greater clarity and maybe uh, uh, more precision in our own thinking. But with strong paradoxes, I think it can really lead to, to some radical conceptual innovation, uh, even to entirely new research programs, as I think we've seen here. Um, so there is a quote I really like by Bell and Davis, who said that the torniest paradoxes have a way of booming into beautiful theories. Uh, but it's, that brings me to, to, to my first question, because I think with many paradoxes, there are various means of evading a paradox, a strong paradox. And so that means that multiple alternative solutions can be proposed as we've shown with, with, with both paradoxes here. Um, so, so for example, with the fair enough ratio, it was inconsistent with the Kolmogorovian probability theory. Um, but contrary to James and, and, and probably Good and Norton, as far as I understand, you don't take it to be intrinsically paradoxical, you just take it to be uh, joint and consistent with Kolmogorov. And so you offered us four alternative um, responses to the paradox. And so given these very different, because they're all very different responses, and yet they're all formally consistent, um, you've argued for a pluralistic stance. So allowing multiple formalisms, um, each with their own virtues and vices, each with a certain range of applicability, um, not only to make sense of, of the paradox itself of a, of a fair infinite lottery, but maybe also taking a purist stance towards these mathematical methods when, when used in cosmology. And so I wondered if you could elaborate a bit more on this pluralist stance. So, so what exactly does the pluralism here entail? I first took it to, to, be, to be that you were arguing for methodological pluralism rather than epistemological or ontological pluralism. 
and, and in your talk even more, I, I started getting the feeling that you're thinking in much more like Torricelli, like little mathematical experiments, trying to get to the extreme to, 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 to get more clarity on, on certain problems, whether it's in the foundations of mathematics or, or in science. You like me to yeah, maybe I'll be there though. Yeah, so thank you for these very nice comments and um, very uh, interesting additional quotes on paradoxes, which I quite like. Um, so, I, a few things. Um, I do think that the paradoxes that I discussed were mainly uh, in your categorization strong paradoxes, but it was also interesting to see that an author like James um, still uh, insists that the paradoxical um, flavor remains even though the action has been removed. So mm -hmm. that is the weak paradox that, that stays yeah. in the air, so, so, yeah. so to speak. Um, and about the, the pluralism part, <coughs> indeed, um, I think it comes from my experimental background that when you have a thought experiment or a model system like fair lottery and natural numbers that I see that as a system that you can try to study with mathematical methods or maybe also in some cases also other philosophical methods and if it's only if you do that with more than one method that you can distinguish between what is the property of the system you started out as the thing you wanted to study and what are artifacts I really think of it as artifacts um, due to the theory you are using. And I see the analogy really strongly to imaging artifacts and you, you need more than one system, also in experimental context, to have a confirmation of a property that is sort of really there. But here the there is in the mathematics rather than in the empirically accessible world. So that is the way I approach it. So I do think it's a methodological pluralism probably. I haven't really thought about what, uh, what that actually means. Um, and yeah, for me that is also connected to, of course, a certain view on what mathematics is and, and, and even how it should be taught and, and so on, so it has a lot of consequences. But I do think it starts from this experience of thinking about paradoxes and, and what it does uh, uh, teach you. Um, I think I forgot the actual question. <laughs> no, no, it yeah, okay. no, helps. It was exactly the point here. What, what kind of, what kind of pluralism did you have in mind when, when yeah, okay yeah no. especially because because they seem to give very different answers to, to certain yeah. questions depending on which form is being adopted and that kind of seems odd yeah for me maybe um, the interesting thing that I didn't really emphasize in this talk is that there is also connective tissue between these theories so for instance if you start with assigning infinitesimals there is an actual function that's called the standard part function that you can apply to it that will round off the infinitesimals. And what you then get is finitely additive but real valued probabilities. So the intuition that the Finetti had, that if you substitute infinitesimals for zero, that actually, if you do the long detour, it can actually tell me that he was right. You can actually make sense of what that intuition was there. So yeah. I think in many cases, when I had a result after a lot of work, I could find authors that had said that thing a lot earlier, even than the Finetti, so these intuitions were already there. Uh, so I think I'm just extremely slow. So I, I do have to really sh show myself that indeed that, that works by doing all the in intermediary steps. Um, but people who have thought about it before me, they actually well, yeah, none of them would be surprised by the results, but I'm, I'm sort of making that connective tissue more tangible or more explicit. Yeah. Can I ask another question? Um, so, so, just a, probably a more technical question, but I, I got lost there when reading it. Um, on on Morton's view, which is maybe not discussed as, as much as mm -hmm. in the paper, but as far as I follow, Norton is taking a lottery to be fair when when the condition of labeling dependence is met. So basically, the chance of an outcome should remain unchanged under permutation of the, the outcome of the labels. And, and in your treatment of the fair infinite lottery, as well as the definitive one, uh, I, I gather, 
labeling really depends on the section of the student. So you take fairness to consist in an actually weaker requirement that each individual outcome has the same chance. And so, so since you're in a sense violating or at least denying label independence, Norton has claimed that you're not actually addressing the problem, you're, you're just changing the problem. Whereas Parker and I, and, and I have to feel you in your paper actually saying, well, it's Norton who's changing the problem. So, so I wanted to know what, what your stand was on this label independence. Do you think the requirement is too strong? Or, or, or do you actually think that it, it should indeed, as Norton says, be generally adopted, given that it certainly holds for, for a fair finite uh, lottery. So, yeah, yeah what's, what's the deal there? Yeah, yeah, maybe let me briefly say something. So, it's a very, um, um, yeah, spot on question. Maybe let me briefly say something about the Norton proposal also for the others. Uh, so, Norton has uh, on several occasions uh, argued that um, many people are too uh, swift to, assign, to start assigning probabilities, for instance, applications of principle of indifference. He thinks those are cases where you, sh you, simply, you simply should refuse to assign probabilities because you need certain types of information to know that the probabilities are equal, for instance. So it is not surprising that also in this case, um, he, he looks at it from that angle and, and says that um, there are, uh, that it, the, the type of knowledge we have in cosmology about these pocket universes is too weak to assign probabilities. So instead he says, we can say something about probability orders, but not um, about uh, actually qu quantitative uh, probabilities. And from that viewpoint, and also the, the, the part about that we don't really have a good way to order these universes, actually in that context, I think his proposal is very um, well pointed, very well designed for the problem at hand. So in that sense, he is not changing the problem in cosmology, he addresses it. He says that we don't know anything about the order uh, of this pocket universe, there is no physical reason to, to impose one. Um, so if we want to talk about probability orderings at least, um, and not introduce more information than is there, uh, then we need uh, this label independence. It shouldn't matter how you label the universes. Um, and indeed, then, what does uh, FAIR uh, mean? Um, it means that uh, no matter how you reorder the labels, uh, the prob to a set, um, the probability should stay the same. And then you get a much weaker probability-like theory, a non-quantitative one, but one with orders. And it does still allow you to make certain distinctions, even among infinite sets. Um, um, so yeah, I think it's very interesting. But if you start from the problem of a fair lottery on the natural numbers, I would say he is changing the problem in the sense that what he is describing is a fair lottery on a count of the infinite sets that doesn't come with uh, native labels. And if you then have that, whatever that set was, and then you impose the labels of the natural numbers, those cannot be used to argue for this approach with natural <coughs> densities, which depend on, on the order that is given. So I think the problem he is addressing is much more underspecified than what Good, for instance, calls the model problem on the integers. When you know it's the integers, I think you can take for granted the order. The pocket universes don't have it, so in that sense, Norton is really addressing the measure problem rather than introducing another model system where stronger assumptions are in place. So I think that is sort of the, the way to answer the question. Like, who is changing the problem? Well, of course, it depends on where you started and what the problem was. Yeah. But then if the independence cannot be meant for, for the cosmological problem, then you, then you end up with, with some kind of theory like Norton's, which is very non quantitative, which is more comparing yeah. probabilities. What, what you could do is start from one that has the label dependence, which are all of the ones we actually discussed, and then do something like super evaluationist, like any order could be it, and how much can you still say, and what you can say is exactly what the only thing that, yeah. that Norton says. So in that sense, he, he goes there directly. But again, I'm interested also in this connective tissue, like you could get at his conclusion by realizing the problem along the way, even though you impose a stronger, uh, yeah, a weaker fairness condition with a stronger way of modeling the system with more structure in a sense, you can do something like 
sets of probability assignments and what will they have in common exactly what Norton already knows. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I have two questions on the very uh, life and way and one open ended. Mm -hmm. uh, um, as a Peter says, I'm a very poor OST thinker, so I'm not sure I understood <laughs> exactly uh, why the, the, the central time models are less conventional than the past hypothesis one. Because it seems to me that uh, taking the lower point entropy uh, at the start of the universe is as functional as saying that what the past is at the state of entropy, right? So I have at the end of that part, clearly. Mm -hmm. And the open-ended question would be, uh, when you introduced uh, the, your uh, non-Archimedean probabilities, you used hyper I was wondering if uh, introducing uh, infinitesimals infinity in other ways and getting uh, smooth analysis or kind of infinitesimal would change your uh, research and what you get out of it. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, so that, uh, um, yeah, I always have trouble <laughs> remembering the previous question when you were saying so it. I, I knew what to, what to answer, but now I forgot what the first question was. Uh, the first one was about uh, how the other models, are, the central time models, uh, are yeah, less the than Yeah, actually, I think maybe I, I made like um, an error of equivocation there because what is definitely true is that these models are very recent are not widely adopted, are considered extremely speculative, and very few people think this is the way to go. So in that sense, they're unconventional. But if you think of convention more as a philosopher, as I should have done, um, you may actually be right that you, you remove uh, an assumption. So in that sense, they don't bear conventional load. It's just that they are not well-developed yet also, and, and maybe there are uh, other aspects of conven conventions that have to be chosen that we are not even aware of because they haven't been developed yet. So I think it's actually fair that you pointed it out. I, I maybe shouldn't have phrased it that, that way, definitely. And then, uh, other ways of introducing infinitesimals. Um, so the alternative you mentioned, was that smooth infinitesimals? Smooth yeah, so these are null potent ones, right? So yeah. if you square them, they are zero. So for my kind of uh, problem, I, I, when I first started considering infinitesimals, so I didn't know much about it at all, I encountered it and I very soon ruled out that that would be, would be a solution for my case. Exactly for cases like this actually, when you have an infinitesimal that tells you what is the probability of an outcome in a natural lottery, and then you do two lotteries, then you would like to square it. But if it ends, ends up zero, there's no hope for arriving at additivity. But actually, since then, I've become, yeah, I've become less sure whether there wouldn't be an other way of, of using intuitionist approaches to these kind of problems. But I will definitely not be the one to do it because I think I've sort of been brainwashed by teaching myself these other methods. So I, I may simply overlook certain possibilities. But I remember that was the reason why I thought, OK, let's not try this, but try something else. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? So the prison of privilege. Mm -hmm. So it's very close to the last question of Thyssen. So because I, I'm always confused about this confusion between philosopher and mathematician, because they seem to talk about different things. So I presume that they all believe, maybe not, correct me, that there's a structure of this universe that is fixed. Mm -hmm. So it's because us, we're there, that we're asking a question about level. So if an economist was doing that, they would say there are two ways it failed. Bad questions in Kolmogorov or not Kolmogorov. And it's you, you, you seem to say that it could be both, you know, your discussion between Norton and that, because it could be bad question, it's not sigma algebra. Mm -hmm. That's typically where you say, oh, we have a good formalism, but we're just confused about the questions. Mm -hmm. Or it's one of the axioms that is not there, and that's not the, the right discussion. So why the natural number? Where did it come from? Why did they say, oh, this question must, the structure of the universe must be 
analogous to natural number. Why? Because you well discussed that if we have natural number, we have blah, 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 and it's very interesting, and we can get beyond the paradox. But I would ask the first one, why natural numbers? Is it fractals, like you said? Mm -hmm. My God, fractals, sets with border that are fractional. Ugh. I have no idea how to put that in Kolodov. Or even in your algebra. I have no idea. Maybe I lack imagination. So, how does it start? Yeah, I, I ran into the so it's very, I think, a very good uh, response to how, yeah, indeed, how strange. Uh, I, I ran into this discussion sort of from the other way around because I wrote a paper about this and I suggested that maybe it's the wrong model system to begin with. And uh, the reviewer, who I think comes from physics, was like, but where do you, how, how do you even consider that it would be non the new world because everyone is assuming this? Like, why, where do you? So then I started looking for sources and I thought I had found one. Uh, who was considering this uh, fractal um, structure, had a model system for that and addressed it more uh, directly in a sense. But in that paper, the authors were considering uh, pa paths in time. So of course that is non denumerable even if the pocket universes are denumerable, that become so, so they were also pointing out that, well, you can work more easily with Komogori Kolmogorovian probabilities if you have this non denumerable thing. So they were trying to assign probability to the paths, but they sort of skipped over the question of whether it would already be non denumerable if you look at the pocket universes. Uh, so I, I then only found one other paper that, tri that tried to, or maybe it was even the same one, that uh, tried to say something about the fractal dimension of this model system. And from that, I could argue that then it would be non denumerable. Uh, but there was only one paper that actually looked into it. So it's it's really, yeah, uh, a model system that's apparently very uh, nearby for physicists, and they don't even question why they are using it. But I do think that I, I agree that it should be questioned. It doesn't seem to fit very well with uh, other things they say about it. Because it, it seems to show that they did twice two mistakes. Yeah. So it's the mistakes that apply to the other to them fair natural lottery, which you show very clearly, and, and you have solutions, mm -hmm. possible solutions possible. that we can discuss. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you start with such a model to even begin to discuss the problem. Yeah, it's a bigger problem. And inflation is around, you know, infinite inflation is around for a long time, so it's very, years. very strange that it's still Messy, that messy. I agree. <laughs> but but obviously, when you point at it, the reviewer says it's not publishable. <laughs> I don't know what they will say. It's okay. very okay. recent. Well, that's interesting because that that could be a community mm -hmm. community um, effect because they all start from this picture and these pocket universe. You could put this label on them, and if we could put the label on them, they must be. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Mm -hmm. okay. Other questions? Mm -hmm. So, first of all, I would like to thank you for this excellent talk. It was really very inspiring and um, clear. Uh, and, and I like the, the formal uh, aspects of it too. Um, and, and, and the style uh, of, of doing philosophy in general. Uh, what I try to do, I guess, uh, try to push things a little bit, break some things, what you can, what you can get as solutions uh, uh, for not breaking. Um, but um, and I'm not sure whether I have a real uh, question that is worthy of the talk, uh, and I certainly don't know enough uh, cosmology to, uh, to, to do that. Uh, but. Maybe this has to do with the 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 the, the, the labeling uh, issues, but it seems that any solution, to me, that any solution to this uh, 
this, this natural number lottery uh, that would end up with the even numbers as having a half, probability a half should be wrong. I mean, there seems to be something uh, deeply wrong about it. Uh, um, I mean, not as a possible solution, but as a de-single solution. That's, I guess, what my... The, the, the thing that's wrong is that, that I mean, the, 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 the lottery system should not care about the order, right? Uh, um, there is order in the natural numbers, but the lottery, uh, by definition almost, uh, forgets about the order. Um, uh, otherwise, it's not a fair lottery, I would say, and, and, and I mean, if you order, you can easily order uh, uh, the natural numbers, obviously, in a way that the even numbers don't at all look like they are half of the cases. Uh, uh, it's just because we go through it. Uh, like, and so, 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 so if the only solution, if the actions give you one half, I mean, it doesn't seem to be right. Uh, it should be among the solutions, I guess. Uh, um, but but and, and and then so with this notion of being among the solutions. So if you drop actions, I mean it's natural that you get much more possibilities, uh, and not like with a possibility diamond, but just as 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 possible models of the actions. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 well. Isn't that like, should we have some, even for the physics uh, uh, purposes, uh, uh, sometimes just refrain from looking for actual probabilities uh, while still talking about probability, but just like this is a problem that has not a single, so not a, just one solution, and uh, it's interesting that it's in, in sort of set of solutions uh, and, and then we can compare several probabilities not because they have uh, uh, because they have one solution but because the, the solutions are a subset of the other ones or something like that mm -hmm. so so um, like is it all or did, what would you say about the idea that all these paradoxes have to do with our desire to find single solutions um, and, and the fact that you can get interesting results by like giving up some aspects, some 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 actions of standard probability theory, uh, actually points to that like sort of an incompleteness uh, as we are used to in set theory. Maybe we should also just accept this incompleteness in many other fields. Uh, um, just unexpressible. Well, not unexpressible, but just not not fixed. Uh, 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 no reason to to, to like say mm -hmm. um, either we find proof or disprove or whatever. It's just among the possibilities, the, the technically possible possibilities, not not mm -hmm. the, the metaphysical possibilities. Yeah, I don't, I'm just uh, freewheeling here. No, but I think the first part. So I think there were like different phases in, in what you were saying. Like the first part was really a defense of the Norton view, I think. So you are really on the same line. Like just I guess, what would it yes, mean? That's why I so I, yeah, you, I think you would completely agree with how he approaches this. So you really start from questioning what does it even mean a fair lot in natural numbers, and that was very much aligned. Um, then there was uh, a phase where you said it a half should be among the possibilities. I think, but maybe that is because now I'm sort of a bit too close-minded. One way to interpret that would be to say that you can use uh, one of the theories I was using. Don't take the original labeling seriously at all. Take all the labeling on, on a par. Then you can uh, apply the probability to any, the, the theory, I mean, to any of these labelings. Mm -hmm. They will exist side by side. The probability of the even numbers will range from 0 to 1, a half will be among them. Um, then I attempted that maybe that is sort of, I, I, I think North, if Norton Mayer would really uh, be very uh, against what I, I will do now, my uh, natural <laughs> inclination is then to think, oh, we go higher order probability. So all of these labeling are equally reasonable, so you sort of assign an equal measure to them, maybe it's not a probability, 
So if you then coarse grain, what is the probability of an even number? It will still be a half. But it will not be because at the first order I only looked at probability a half. It's because I average over all the possible labelings. So in this particular case, I would still end up in probability, probability a half. Um, but there would be a lot of sort of spreads on it. So I wouldn't, I mean, the whole range is from 0 to 1. But, but you would remain with the formalism. To, if, yeah, I would, I would be applying the formalism in a certain way so that I have infinitely many cases, how I can apply it, actually not enumerably many. I average out over it, so to speak. I still end up in all, but for a different reason than first order, uh, in that sense. But maybe, given what you said at the beginning, you should actually say, but I don't want a theory. Like, I think that is what you were saying. I don't want to apply any of the theories you were doing. That, so I, I don't want to do some kind of super evaluation over those kind of theories. You really have to reconsider the actions. But then I don't really know how to get started because with Norton you drop, you drop assigning numbers. It's really orderings. He gives them names to talk about them, but they aren't really. It's not a half doesn't really make sense there. So I'm not sure you can really get anything in between those two options. Maybe there is, <coughs> but I have. I, at the moment I, I cannot really imagine what it would look like. But I. There seems to be something weird about this averaging out strategy. That, yeah. that, that's kind of a meta for probability, as you, I think that's what yeah. you use. Uh, uh, order. Which is very interesting, but it's not probability. No. Right? Um, so that might be a good strategy to actually deal with, with this incompleteness. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't take away the incompleteness. No. Um, and, and, and we can have, we could perfectly have both. Uh, just say, well, uh, these are all interpretations of the actions we all accept for some reason, uh, and uh, then we go study uh, uh, like we do in 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 in, in, in set theory nowadays. Uh, we we are interested in several universes and compare them and so on. Um, and they all have, they all are set theories to some extent, or universal set theory that, that makes some internal sense. Uh, and I would say that just for probability, you have several interpretations of probability actions. Um, if you get rid of some actions uh, that maybe are not uh, ideal. Um, and then you can indeed use some meta probability theory maybe uh, to, 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 to make sense of, of what to do with the, the, the diversity of possibilities, uh, possible possibilities. Uh, like, is there, like, that doesn't mean that you ever get to one a half as a probability of the lottery paradox. It still means, uh, or pro uh, probability that it's an even number. Mm -hmm. It just means that, uh, uh, yeah, that, that I don't know, I find it difficult to, 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 to think about this meta probability. I guess I should think more about it. But, but, but not, not, not that it's a, a half. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's that we have uncertainty and, yeah. and we can measure this uncertainty. But that's at the level of that's an epistemic uh, probability that you are then interested in. Yeah, yeah. Which is also very interesting, but it's, it's a step higher, wouldn't you agree? Uh, um, and, and, and so I. With the infinit infinitism, well, you didn't get to, to one and a half, uh, two and a half, uh, did you? You said that actually or depends on some choices. Yeah, depends actually on the ultra filter on the natural numbers that you use. And that, that is very interesting, interesting right? Yeah, I'm uh, thinking so. That I actually would find that a good thing. Uh, don't try to get to a half. It is not, uh, there is no reason to, to, to go for a half. But it's interesting, in numerosity theory, there is a convention to assume that alpha is actually divisible by any uh, natural number. So then it would be exactly a half because of that reason. It's also an even number, so it will be a half. So it's also interesting that there is this push to, although you have this non-enumerable set of, of ultra filters that you could use, that they, that they, it, also, it, it almost is like a scholastic uh, discussion, right? Like, what is the divisibility of the numerosity of the natural numbers? Like, I'm also more inclined to say, let's allow all the possibilities. 
it's an epistemic thing. We, we really cannot settle that. Uh, it's beyond things you should expect to be able to answer with, uh, with the kind of theory you use. So I think in that sense I'm on, on the same page as you. Uh, and I will think about the other <laughs> the other case that you introduced. Yeah. Other questions? Pick me. Pick me. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry for having to step out so much. Um, I think it's finally under control. Um, I wanted to ask about James. So I'm just thinking, what does he want us to do? So is his is his proposal just like these are all badly formed questions and you people should go home and work on something else? Is that really the move? Is the move that like look, there just is no like asking the question. How do we apply probability to a fair lottery on the natural numbers? Is his opinion that like that's just a bad question, or what does he want to say? Yeah, it's it's a strange um, thing because I started looking into it because I actually initially thought he was um, uh, uh, defending a theory like the Finetti because he doesn't want to put in this action of countable additivity, but then he seems to assume you get that naturally. So it's a very strong intuition he has that that that, that is so obvious, it's even more obvious than an action in the way he talks about it. So indeed from that perspective, certain questions are in, intrinsically inconsistent because it is so basic, you don't even have to put it in the action. It's clearly, you're cl clearly crazy if you think that that makes sense. That is what seems to be happening because in his probability theory only has finite additivity explicitly and then the, re yeah, the rest comes from physical intuition which means he has been taught standard measure theory long ago, he forgot it, he became part of the system, that's what I think happened <laughs> and that is now the only way you can see the world, that's what, how I read what happens there, I don't uh -huh. understand it otherwise, uh -huh. but of course yeah, it's not yeah. a philosopher, it's yeah. That's really interesting. Maybe, maybe I read it the wrong way, but that is the only way I can explain what he writes. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, it's fucking super, yeah, it's funky. <laughs> exactly. No, cool, that helps, that helps. Other questions or comments? Can you tell um, so, 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 I don't know much about the probability uh, um, uh, paradoxes. I know much more about uh, the, the semantic and the, the, the set theoretical paradoxes um, and, and possible solutions to therapy that people have proposed uh, uh, for that. And um, people have also tried to unify such paradoxes because they look quite similar. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, probability paradox maybe do not. But is there any hope in, in, in sort of um, not starting from ZFC at all, uh, but starting from something weaker that can allow for um, inconsistent, or at least uh, uh, self-numbered uh, sets, um, uh, and a <coughs> set and so on, without leading to paradoxes, and people have tried such things. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, would that be a strategy worth trying out? Uh, like keeping the maybe the the, the, the usual Kumogoro actions, like assuming a, a a less paradox, uh, suggesting a, a, a set theory uh, uh, on the back in the background. Yeah. What's a very interesting suggestion. I haven't explored it at all. I did put ZFC as another background assumption. I, I did want to make it explicit because it's definitely there. I didn't go that far back, so I did go back to the real numbers, but that's still in ZFC, obviously. Um, I, I don't really have a clear intuition. I mean, related to these non-measurable sets that you always have, like in, in other I mean, you don't, have, you don't need to introduce the fair lottery paradox to, to get those. Um, in response to that, I think it would be a natural move to consider uh, alternative set theory to start from. So I guess in that context people will have worked on it. 
and it's not something I, I have a clear view on what is there and whether it would have any impact in this case. Yeah, I should check. I don't know. Yeah. But there's a price, price to pay, of course. You get differential weakness. I mean, it, it, there is no, no serious satire done in these alternatives. Yeah. Like you get some weaker results uh, um, that, I mean, don't give, like, certainly not the strength to do foundation <coughs> semantics or anything. No. Um, so then, of course, the question is what do you lose? Uh, um. Yeah, the, the question is also like, would it fit certain of these certain problems in cosmology? Because we seem to have so little grip on what the structure even is. Maybe a very weak theory would actually be a good thing. So mm -hmm. you don't have to impose structure that isn't actually there or you don't know about. Uh, and, and therefore you don't introduce what I think of as artifacts due to the theory. So it could be very natural to start at the actual problem that cosmologists have. And, and start building a theory from that point. That's that's not even what I what I did, but maybe that is that is what it could look like. Yeah. And then you would expect to have a very weak theory because you have very little to start from anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other questions or comment? I have more, but <laughs> you're the master of time. What? Yeah. You discuss about the direction of time in the classical statistical mechanics, the same yeah. case, and even you made me even more confused than the ordinary problem. Oh. <laughs> which is not because the problem, the other talk was very clear, but for now it seems to me that the problem is even worse than I thought. Okay. So let me just express what I understood and after that you can correct me. So so in Classical statistical mechanics, we try Boltzmann, for example, we try to put probabilities on phase space, and there's a lot of problems with that. And so it's why now we have a very nice picture, ergo, er ergotic system, because it's another way to put probability that seems much more intuitive, you know, the problem, the time you spend, yeah. and you have to go everywhere in the phase space, and you come in an infinite time to the same place, blah, blah, blah. Put it aside the fact that we have no idea of how our universe is like that. Mm -hmm. Is it implicit in this approach that the, 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 that the, you can circumscribe the phase space? <coughs> but if you have an expanding universe, the phase space is augmenting all the time. So should we use that? You mean in the standard approach? So yeah, because standard? it seems that our yeah. intuition of probability is related to yeah. spending time in certain zone of this yeah. phase space. But it was all designed with the notion of I have a phase space and I go around and I spend a certain time yeah. there. But now I don't even have a space phase space because if I have this expanding universe, the phase space is increasing all the time. Mm -hmm. So do we need to imagine the phase space that could be possible, so not the phase space of my universe, but the phase space of possible universe in expansion, which would be a second level notion of space space, like there's a possibility out there. Or I'm very confused about the phase space of an inflationist yeah. theory. I haven't spent a lot of time um, looking at uh, the, the, the standard approach, actually, in that case. Um, but uh, something that I do want to get back to is the, um, the toy model I showed you the, of Goldstein and colleagues. Mm -hmm. So that is of the, non, um, yeah, the, the central time model. Um, they do mention that this is a non-ergodic theory. Okay. So that's already interesting. And I, what, I, what wasn't clear to me, and is something I still want to figure out, is whether this non-ergodicity is coupled one-to-one -to, -one to this failure of tunnel vulnerability or not. So I, I, I have literally a paper on my desk with this question, like figure out the relation, so think about it more. So there's definitely something there that's interesting to explore. Uh, but what you asked about, I don't even know how that works exactly with the expansion and the phase space action in the, in the, in the normal approach, how they do it. Uh, so, it's also, so, yeah. yeah. So because if it's not important, you have to include probability or Probability in another way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they don't explain that. 
Yeah, so what they are using is a measure. They don't, I don't think they call it a probability. So this non, uh, so these authors uh, don't call it a probability measure because it is unbounded. I have called it quasi-probability. Um, but all the, con the conditional measures are, look like conditional probability. So in that sense, I think it is okay to call it a quasi-probability. Um, but it's definitely non-organic, uh, non-ergotic in their uh, mm -hmm. thing, non-organic. <laughs> um, um, in, in that case, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I can't answer directly, but there is something okay. of interest there's, there's related there's to There's a cut there between the classical, we hope the world is here, the garden, now the best book. A good model of the universe is explicitly non Yeah. So we're going to have to find another way to to get an intuitive notion of problems there. Yeah, I agree. Okay, okay thank you. But even in economics, they're now working with non ergodic models, right? So maybe we have to live with them. <laughs> yeah, but they haven't, they haven't much, as far as I understand, because I'm teaching one class was an economist about causality and social sciences. Okay. As far as I understood, they have a much less uh, much less uh, ontological notion of probability. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. that's true. Because there's a, a big part of, not all part, but there's a big part of the history of economy that was an empiricist reaction against probability. Mm -hmm. So yes, they work with all kind of models, but they, mm -hmm. it would not put this, it would not say the direction of time is coming from, no, from, no, from, from, a, from a probability reasoning. That, yeah, because yes. even if, the Boltzmann did, did believe the world is maybe deterministic. I think they were taking the direction of time quite seriously as, as a real result. Yeah, sure. To approximate uh, thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now, now I'm getting confused thinking about his central time order. Because I mean, it, it looks very much like what Boltzmann proposed. I mean, in the sense that, let's assume that there is this maximum entropy with Boltzmann then, and, and you get all these fluctuations out of the maximum. If it only goes deep enough, you can create a whole universe, but you also get these two arrows of time, of yeah, course. Time time is so that's very similar, but since they don't allow, I mean, since they, since they say that entropy can keep on increasing, there is no maximum, yeah. there is no nature of Boltzmann brains, I think, etc. cetera. But, yeah. but, but so, so where is the big bang on this model? It can, can be any central time because I mean, obviously. Yeah. Sorry, I'm getting confused. So the idea is that if you would randomly initiate a universe like that, that is where this uniform probability problem came in. Like you want to distribute the positions and the uh, <coughs> momenta are random, really randomly. So it's like a very big fair lottery on the possible systems, and you then look at the time evolution, then this curve. So you initialize initialize it at an arbitrary point that has no physical meaning will always look like that. So there yes. will be a minimum in that curve. Mm -hmm. So you don't postulate that, whatever, however you initialize it, it will have a minimum and that is the central time and that will look like the big bang of that universe. Okay. So that is how it works. Yeah. Okay, then that's to clarify the graphs. Yeah. Two directions from one big bang is too hard. Was defining that, defining, uh, defending yeah. that in the yeah. conference last year. Here, mm -hmm. okay. they like that mm -hmm. because it's a way to get rid of the past. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it is but they they do an analogy with quantum mechanics. Which it's an analogy. Yes. Mm -hmm. It is it also fits well with quantum cosmology stuff yeah. because in the quantum cosmology you have this non really big bang and you have just a, a smaller state and then it just go to and two directions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they hope that it will fit everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think relational mechanics, there are also models on relational mechanics that look like I'm not so familiar with them, so I don't know present them. I have one more kind of, this is a bit. I guess maybe this is sort of in the spirit, although much less sophisticated, because I don't know the theory that you're working with. Or <coughs> Peter's question, going back to asking about about set theory, um, it also strikes me that an important kind of putting in a putting a, a normally uncontested uh, 
assumption back in question in, in a lot of what you're doing is this turn to the numerosity theory instead of instead of cardinality, mm -hmm. right? Because I mean, like one a nice kind of general way to phrase a lot of these responses, like, look, we're just always putting the wrong thing in the denominators of all of these things anyway. So like, of course we did, we lacked the ability, right? We just didn't know how to talk about. Um, so in part, just because I'm completely ignorant about it, but like, tell me a little bit more about this and how you see that, that assumption. Because that, that strikes me as like a potentially really important and super interesting move that could be useful for all, like, all over the place, mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. If there's a much more fine-grained and interesting way to think about sizes of really, really big sets, that's really cool. Yeah. Um. I think it is. Really <laughs> um, yeah, so numerosity theory, um, the way I usually introduce it is that for finite, yeah, of course you all know, for finite sets you can look and compare sizes in at least two ways and they are consistent. One is that if you have two sets and you can put the elements in one-to-one -one correspondence, you conclude they are equal uh, probability. Um, but it is also the case in the finite uh, case that if you have one set and you take a strict superset, uh, subset, it will have a smaller um, size. Uh, and those two assumptions together are not consistent in the infinite case, and it's actually uh, Dedekind, I think, definition of infinity, that an infinite set can be put into one to one corresponding to a proper set. Okay, you all know that. But then, if you want to make a sense of the notion of size in the infinite case, you're actually facing a choice. Do you take size based on one-to-one -one correspondence, or to uh, having uh, such that a strict uh, subset has a smaller size. You could go two ways, and we've always gone one way, and it's already very counterintuitive that there are different sizes of infinity in the sense of cardinality, but there is this other option. You can, can you make sense of size subscript 2, which is now called numerosity, which takes as an action that numerosity, whatever else that may be, is such that it is strictly smaller if you are uh, talking about strict subsets. Uh, so there is now an action like theory to prove these actions are inconsistent. You use a method from non-standard or non-Archimedean uh, mathematics. So you can think of them <coughs> as hypernatural numbers coming from non-standard models of the natural numbers. But they give you very plausible, intuitive um, um, yeah, assignments if, if you take this strict subset relation as indicative of notion of size. And it's also not a choice against cardinality in the sense that, again, there is connective tissue there. So it is the case that if the numerosity is the same, the cardinality is the same, the cardinality is the same, it's not necessarily the same numerosity, obviously, but there are all kinds of rules uh, how big the numerosity difference can be, basically, for it to, to have the same cardinality. So I, I don't see it as against cardinality. It's really, you can do both of them. It's interesting to, to do both of them. Uh, but on the numerosity side, it's a recent theory, and a lot of very intuitive questions are underdetermined because nobody has simply cut. So there is a lot. So for the natural numbers and its subsets, I think it's all developed. But as soon as you go bigger than that, eh, mm, it's okay. simply not many people have worked on it. So that is also what you always have. You can always have this. I think of it as sort of counterfactual mat mathematics. What if somebody had taken that route earlier than counter? What would mathematics now look like? Well, we don't know. But in any case, at this time, very few people are developing. There are a few mathematicians in Italy working on it. Not very young mathematicians, so I mean, hope somebody steps in sooner rather than later. But because I do think there are more cool applications, yeah. but it's sort of underpopulated and therefore underdeveloped. Cool. <laughs> Please to make it stop. <laughs> <laughs> how, how are you? It's 21, so we could have as many as nine minutes if we wanted. But or we or yeah. to continue the discussion. Because some part about infinity yes. is only understandable with a certain <laughs> brain. <Yeah. laughs> so thank you, I forget it was remarkably clear. Very, very nice. Thank you.